All righty, gang. There's some folks who are not here. I hope you're watching the video. Take a note that we added a new thing to our boilerplate. So if you have a boilerplate file, you're going to want to add that. Use underscore math underscore defines as that. Underscore use underscore math underscore defines. Just tack that onto the top of your file. And now we've written some code here, and we're demonstrating the use of get line. We need to use get line if the input is going to support spaces, like for a first name and last name. When we ask for their name, we need to allow space if they want to type one. And so CIN arrow arrow name is not good enough, because if they typed in a first and last name, the name would only equal their first name. And then we're going to ask for their color. And then down here at the bottom, we print out those two things. So if you're doing this at home, pause the recording and catch up. Then unpause it. All right, why don't we make color work the same way? Just for the same reason. They may want to type in deep purple. They're a classic rock fan, so that's what their favorite color is. Okay, so instead, get line, parentheses, C-I-N, comma, what? Well, what's our variable name? Color. Color, okay. Yeah, let's ask for their age. Seems like we're always asking for people's ages, so let's ask for their age. Int age. Semicolon. C out, arrow, arrow, quote, what is your age, question mark, space, space, greater than, end quote, semicolon. Now we're going to use just CIN. You would not use get line for this because it doesn't make any sense for a number to have spaces. Right. If it's supposed to be a whole number or a floating point number, it's not going to have spaces. So we would not use get line for that. So CIN greater than greater than H. Now let's make sure this works. Let's make sure it works perfectly so that even if we have two words for every answer, except for the number, that it works right. I'm kind of halfway wondering if it is. In Java, you can get things messed up if you use a get line function followed by a getting it of an integer. Maybe C++ doesn't have that problem. I don't recall. Let's find out. So what is my name? My name is Slim Shady. My favorite color is deep purple. Name equals Slim Shady. What is your age? Seven. All right. Seem to work. Seem to work. Good. I never saw it display the color. Why did I comment that out? Oh. Well, I goof this. Uncomment out that line if you're following my example exactly. And then cut that get line and replace the code, what is your favorite color, like that. All right, I apologize for that. And we still got to make sure it works. Let me run it real fast before. I am surprised that worked at all. Okay, what is your name? Joe Bob. Favorite color, deep purple. What is your age? 17. Well, it's not printing out your age, but the rest of it seems to be working. So, see out what is your name, get line, CIN common name. See out what is your favorite color, get line, CIN color. Then we can print out our name and our color, followed by int, what is your age, CIN error, error, age. Now, we're going to get to the point where it's annoying having to answer all those questions every time we test. Bless you. So, we may wind up sticking code up at the top, underneath main, rather than down here. I kind of like for those two print statements to be underneath the age question. So I'm going to cut those two and paste them underneath CIN age and add a print for that as well. So I need one more C out. You saw what I did. I took out the name equals and the color equals statements and I pasted them underneath right above our pause statement if you have one. And I want one more. C out arrow arrow quote age equals end quote arrow arrow age arrow arrow end quote just for completeness sake, right?
anybody have syntax errors that you wish eyes were eyeballs were looking at okay how about if you want to read a single character press any key to continue cin greater greater than ch that actually doesn't work now we could use this technique that we're just about to show to replace that pause well, let's give that a try. C out, arrow, arrow, quote, press any key to continue, space, space, greater than, end quote, semicolon. Now we need a character to hold our space. Why not a string? I don't know, but we're demonstrating a character. So care, space, C-H, C-I-N, arrow, arrow, C-H, semicolon. Not going to work right. At least not according to my expectation. What is your name? Joe. My favorite color is TY. My age is 89. Press any key to continue. Not what I want to see. It's not working. If I hit H and then hit Enter, it works, but that's not any key, right? That's two keystrokes. So that's not cool. I want to use something called Git Car. Git Care. Excuse me, it's not called that. That's the wrong language. It's called cin.git. So we're going to change this statement. We're not going to use cin error errors. We're going to use cin.git parentheses in parentheses. I think I've already goofed that. Yeah, I forgot to put the ch inside the parentheses. Now it should work right. What is your name? Bruh. Favorite color? Five. What is your age? Six. Press any key to continue. Okay. I did not press any key to continue, and it went ahead and went past it. I'm going to change this message to hit enter. Not that that's going to change the way it worked, but I got confused by seeing two messages that were very similar to each other. And I'm going to go more slowly. My name is Bob. My color is pink. Should have said Floyd. What is your age? Nine. And you see that? It did hit enter and then immediately went to the next character. I mean, to the next message. It didn't wait for us to hit enter. What if that was the first command? Maybe it would have worked there. But we're not seeing any success getting this code to work. As an experiment, you don't need to do this, but as an experiment, I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it at the very top of main. Just to see if it works correctly there. What, do I have an error? Oh, it's telling me the CH is already defined. How about I just call it C? All right. All right, hit enter. Right now it's working. It was positionally dependent. That's disturbing. Let's see if the PowerPoint has some way of fixing that. Otherwise, I'm never going to use CIN. Get. So mixing CIN error arrow and CIN.get can cause input errors that are hard to detect. So what do we got to do? We got to use dot ignore to ignore everything until a carriage return. Kind of weird to have to do this, but we have to. We have to blast the input buffer so that when we issue the dot get command, there's nothing waiting for it. Because for some reason, there is something waiting for it after those prior statements. So let's do that. If we add this chn.ignore business, 
above cin.get. cin.ignore Let's see if that's enough. What's your name? Floyd. Color pink. 90. Hit enter. Seemed to work. Let's see if we can mess it up. I'm going to leave some stuff in the buffer. What is your name? Joe. Color pink. What is your age? 30. But what if I put a whole bunch of spaces there? Maybe even a dot. It did skip the enter key. Is that because I didn't use the syntax here for the second one? Second syntax shown. Where they do ignore 10 comma quote backslash in. Well that would ignore the next 10 characters but we had more than 10 characters. Let's, enter, let's ignore a whole bunch of characters. Like 99999 comma single quote backslash in single quote once more with feeling name is Floyd my favorite color is pink my favorite number is 80 followed by a whole bunch of spaces hit enter so that is working correctly you could just as a matter of course add this in front of every CIN statement you use it looks ugly I wouldn't use it until I found it was necessary. When might it be necessary? If they type in incorrect data, right? If they type in a string rather than a number for a numeric value. Let's ask them one more thing. Like let's ask them for their height. So CIN Nope, nope, nope. See out, arrow, arrow, quote, what is your height in inches? Question mark, space, space, greater than. I'm sticking this above that, hit enter. So greater than, double quote, semicolon. I forgot to declare a variable for that, so int inches. And then cin, arrow, arrow, inches. See out, quote, height or you are space in quote arrow arrow inches arrow arrow less than less than quote space inches tall period backslash in end quote semicolon the reason I did this is I'm going to type in an invalid value for age and then see what it does with inches. What's your name? Joe. Favorite color? Pink. What's your age? I'm going to type in something wrong. It's supposed to be an int. What if I type in a floating point? Like 90.9. .9. Alright, what is your height in inches? You're zero inches tall. I messed it up. It went into an error state, is what it did. If I would entered a word there, rather than a floating point number, it would also have entered an error state. Name is pink. Favorite color, pink. Age, pink. You see what it did? What is your height in inches? You are negative 8 billion inches tall. Well, that's an accomplishment. It's not what we wanted. Maybe that cin.ignore would, would have fixed it for us. But it's in an error state once we type in some kind of data that it's not expecting. I'm going to use that cin.ignore in front of the cin inches just to see if it does fix it. I could copy and paste it, but just to make it easy to see. Above that cin error error inches, I'm going to do cin.ignore parentheses 99999 comma. And it's not a match. It, it's, it could be any number. I just want to make sure it's large enough single quote backslash in end apostrophe in parentheses semicolon let's see if that handles that error condition and then I better walk about make sure I haven't lost y'all what's your name Bob favorite color Bob my age Bob 
It still didn't fix it. Well, maybe we'll find out how to fix it. The thing that you have to do is you have to clear the errors, error state. Let's see if the PowerPoint shows how to do that first. Let's make sure it works if you type in the good data, though, right? Joe, pink, 30, 20. What is your height in inches? 70. Hit enter. Okay, so as long as you're entering good data, things are good. This did not fix the problem. So I'm going to remove that line of code, and then I'm going to walk about and see how y'all are doing. Does anybody need me to scroll up higher? Just for the people playing at home, here's main. Pause it as you need. Then down to age. And then the hit enter code. And lastly, but not least, the system pause. OK. All right, so strings are actually classes. Well, string is a class, so they are actually objects, meaning that they have functions built into them, known as methods. They're calling them member functions. I guess that's a uh, acceptable term for what 8 million other textbooks would call a method. A method is just a function that's attached to a piece of data. For example, if you want to find the length of a string, you want to find out how long the word Lady Gaga is, you use the string followed by a dot, followed by length, parentheses and parentheses. If you feel like it, if you need to join multiple strings, you can do that with the plus sign. This is pretty much like Python and many other languages you see. String C1 equals, quote, hot, end quote, semicolon. String C2 equals pink, end quote, semicolon. String C3 equals PO, no wait, C1 plus a, quote, space plus C2. I didn't say, quote, space, quote. C3 equals C1 plus double quote, space, double quote, plus C2, semicolon, and then we could print it out if we wanted to. C out, error, error, quote, C3 equals, end quote, error, error, C3, error, error, and yeah. And it's just going to print out hot pink. What's your name? G. What's your favorite color? G. What's your age? 90. Your height in inches, 90. You are 90 inches tall. Hit enter. C3 equals hot pink. Okay, so it worked. We're getting to the point where we're having to answer way too many questions in order to keep testing right. So I'm probably going to scroll up and put everything under the main declaration rather than keep adding on here. This is just known as concatenation. You can also concatenate with plus equals, like C3 space plus equals quote, space is an awesome color, exclamation mark, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. And that's what it'll print. It'll print hot pink is an awesome color. These are just concatenation examples. Get the length of our new string. Int space C3 LEN equals C3 dot. And ooh, wee, look at all those functions. Append, clear, that'd probably wipe the string out. I don't know what back means or begin means. Data dot empty, dot empty would probably check to see if it was empty. Right? All sorts of functions. We're just going to use dot length for whatever purpose. Parentheses, in parentheses, semicolon. Well, that didn't work. I mistyped it. There. 
I don't think we need to print that out. We can just depend on it working. Dot length returns the length of the string. More math library functions. Well, I think we've been using POW, but we got lots more. You need to take the sine, the cosine, the tangent, the square root, the log, the absolute value. By the way, if you ever can't find the square root function, doesn't seem to be built in, you could always just do this. Float x. I better not use x. Value equals POW parentheses 10 comma 0 0.5 that takes the square root of it why 0 0.5 well we'd have to sit up here and do the math but anything to the power of one half is the square root anything to the power of 1.33333 is a cube root and 1 over 4 0 0.25 is the uh, you know the fourth root, whatever that is called. But that's kind of cheesy looking. We wouldn't want to do that. Not if we have the square root function. So value equals SQRT parentheses 10. Those just do the same thing. I don't care if you remember that. That just happens to be a quickie way of doing it if you can't find the square root function. Take something to the exponent of 0 0.5. What does it say the square root of negative 1 is? I'm just curious about that. So C out, arrow, arrow, square root is space, end quote, arrow, arrow, value, arrow, arrow. And this is just satisfying my curiosity. I have no idea. Bob, Bob, 12, 12, hit enter. Okay, not a number in a n. Better not try to do math with that value, not the square root of a negative number. Square root of negative 1 is what's known as an imaginary number, i. It's a different axis. Okay, so that's kind of stupid. I'm going to take that away from being negative 1, and I'm going to make it 10 again. So if you need these functions, you have them available to you in CMath. Just as a warning, I think they want radians as their input rather than degrees. So you're not going to be able to do um, tangent of 90 degrees and get 1, or whatever the tangent of 90 degrees is supposed to be. Maybe undefined. Rise over run. There's no run if it's 90 degrees. Anyways, right. If the input is radians, you're going to have to do your conversion from degrees to radians, which you can find functions to do. So more math library functions. These require CSTD live. Now random numbers are fun because we can start making dice games or guessing games or something like that. So this is pretty cool. Why don't we add that to the top of it? And we should actually probably even add it to our boilerplate if we're going to be using random numbers all the time. But I'm going to scroll up to the top of my code and do pound sign include C std live to get random numbers doesn't matter what order these includes are by the way pound sign include less than c std lib lib greater than now we can generate random numbers RAND generates a random number between 0 and the largest int the computer holds. Not the compute holds. Unlike most languages, it's not a self-seeding number. 
Seed means starting off at a certain value. Random is actually what's known as a pseudo-random function. It will generate the same sequence of numbers every time given the same starting point. It's just a fact that computers don't really have a way of calculating truly random numbers. And I don't know, maybe quantum computers do or something strange like that. But they have to have a mathematical formula to generate those random numbers because they don't have a little die rolling machine inside there, right, to roll the dice in order to get it to work. But let's kind of prove that to ourselves. We're going to print out some random numbers. So C out, arrow, arrow, R E N D. Parentheses, in parentheses, arrow, arrow, E, and DL. And then just copy and paste that like five or six or ten times or something like that. Cool, some random numbers. Let's run it again. And the same random numbers. That's kind of lame. If we're making a guessing game, why are you underlining? Expect an identifier. Oh, no, you didn't. Why are you saying that? Unrecognized preprocessing directive. What have I done wrong? Was I getting those errors earlier and I just didn't notice? That's crazy. A blank line was messing it up. All right. Delete the blank line. Maybe you're not getting those problems. Each time I run it, I get the same numbers. It starts at 41. That's not for making for a very good, you know, if I was playing poker and I got the same order of cards every single time, I might either think that's the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world. We need to seed our random number generator. Let's do this int seed, let's ask them for the seed, just to kind of prove a point, and then we'll automate the setting of the seed. So C out, arrow, arrow, quote, random number seed, question mark, space, space, greater than, end quote, semicolon, and then C-I-N, arrow, arrow, seed, semicolon. It's back to doing it again. I'm seeing these underlines here. What is your pro? Okay, and then they fixed them themselves. All right, that's kind of weird. All right, so random number C. What's my random number going to be? I don't know. Why don't I type in 999? And those are my random numbers. Didn't work because I didn't actually use the srand function to seed it. I asked for it, and then I forgot to set it. My mistake. So underneath where I ask for the seed, I'm going to actually use srand to set it. srand parentheses seed in parentheses semicolon. You saw me type an underscore and that was a mistake. Set the random number generator seed. Random generator seed. All right. Run it. My seed is 999. The first number is 3300. The last number is 4744. I'm going to run it again. 999, 3300, 4744. It generates the same series of numbers if I set the seed to the same thing. But if I set the seed to a different value each time, it generates a different series. And that's good. So how could we simulate that? We need a random number in order to seed the random number generator. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe somebody's heard of this and knows how to do it. How could we pick a number that's kind of random looking? You asked for the number of seconds since midnight, right? It's unlikely that I'm going to run this at exactly 7,000 seconds after midnight every single day. So if you ask for the current time and use that as your seed, then things will work out. So I'm going to comment out these two lines. We've kind of proven the point there. And we're going to get the seed. Seed equals time, not two, time, parentheses, in parentheses. Now that didn't work. There's probably a different pound sign in include needed for time. Let me Google this up. 
S Rand time parentheses in parentheses. Time dot age. Well, but that's C library. I want the C the C plus plus version. Yeah, that'd probably work, but I want to stick with C plus plus header files. It's still showing time dot age. Come on, guys. Okay, C time. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to come up here and add something else, more stuff I could put in my boilerplate. Pound sign include less than C time greater than. And it seems to be wanting a, a parameter for time. I don't remember what that parameter is, so I'm going to highlight it. I think I saw it in the uh, example code. Seems to be wanting something in there. I could just put in null or not. Fine. Let me look at the example a little bit more closely. Zero. Null is into zero, huh? Capital null might have worked. All right. So if I use the current number of seconds since midnight or since 1970 or whatever that function is supposed to return as my seed, I will get a different series of numbers each time. That time it was 18390. This time it's 18410. This time it's 18423. It always seems to be starting with 18, oddly enough. Huh. All right, fine. But the rest of the numbers are, are, are significantly different. 19744 as opposed to. 7950 as opposed to 18175. I don't know. I might just want to throw the first number away because it seems to be, you know, pretty close to the last one if we ran it again. But the rest of the numbers are pretty different. The random number generator uses the last value generated as input to the function that calculates the next one and so on. And so starting at the same seed, it'll always generate the same values. Now, since I went to the trouble of looking that up, let's find out if the PowerPoint told me how to do that. No, didn't even give any examples. Are there any better random number functions than something that just generates a number between zero and the largest whatever it can support? Random numbers, C++. I'm looking for a function that like might return a series of numbers between 1 and something, or 0 and something. Not really jumping out at me. That's too bad. Java and Python and stuff like that give you a function that gives you a nice random number. If you modulus it by a value, if you mod, mod by 100, you get a number between 0 and 99. So say we like we want to roll some cubic dice, six-sided dice. We want numbers between 1 and 6. Here's how you do that. Modulus 6 plus 1, because a mod 6 gives you a number between 0 and 5, right? Because if you have the number 7, and you modulus it by 6, you get 1. If you have the number 36 and you modulus it by 6, you get 0. You'll never actually get 6 by this formula up to this point. So you add 1 to it so that it's not 0 to 5, but 1 to 6, just like you know a normal die roll. And I'm going to take that, copy and paste it all the way down here. These might be my die rolls. All right, now they're all numbers between 1 and 6. 
Now we didn't get every single number, but that's the same. You know, as if you roll one die seven times in a row, you're not guaranteed to get every number that it supports. You might get, you know, seven threes in a row. All right. Let's get a number that's three dice added together. So in total equals, we ought to make a function that does this right here. I'm going to make a function that calculates that. So I'm going to come up above main and do int space die underscore roll. Die is the plural. I mean the singular for dice. Parentheses, in parentheses, hit enter, curly brace, in curly brace. Int result equals s, excuse me, r e n d parentheses, in parentheses, mod 6 plus 1. Now that doesn't work for 20 sided dice. If you're a DD player, you would need to change that 6 to 20. We could make that a value that we passed in as a parameter. But I'm not I'm gonna leave well enough alone for now. So down here, when we calculate our total, can't fit it all on one page, can I? So I'm gonna pause here. If y'all are typing these examples in, you're gonna to want to put that above main. And then down there the bottom. Anybody need me to keep this code on the screen a little bit longer? We all good? Alright, down here I'm going to say int total equals die underscore roll parentheses in parentheses. That just rolls one die. And then total plus equals die underscore roll. That's the second die. Die underscore roll parentheses in parentheses. And then once more for feeling. Total equals like that. You could print that out. C out, arrow, arrow, quote, total of three dice equals space, end quote, arrow, arrow, total, arrow, arrow, end deal. And yeah, the textbook hasn't mentioned functions yet, but we pretty much almost all of us have had other programming classes and we know what a function is, or a module, as they called it in fundamentals. Got a syntax here. It didn't seem to run. I didn't return it, right? I calculated the value, but I did not return it. So that didn't do a bit of good. Scroll back up to int space die roll return result semicolon that should work a lot better unless I have any other syntax errors there we go the total of three dice equals nine if we ran it again hopefully we get a different total total of three dice equals 14 so the takeaway or some notes to add To generate random numbers, include C, wait, which function was it? Which library was it? SDD lib, C SDD lib. So include C SDD lib and C time. That's one thing you got to do. And then seed your random number generator with srand. You don't have to do it like this. You could just do this. Seed your random number generator like this. srand parentheses time parentheses zero close parentheses close parentheses semicolon. Right. You don't have to create a temporary variable to hold the result of time like I did down there. All right. To generate a random number, random number sign between zero and whatever, use R E N D parentheses in parentheses semicolon to generate a random number 
between 1 and 20. Use R and D parentheses in parentheses mod 20 plus 1. Now when I say whatever, that just means a really large value. I think it's 65535 or 32,000 or something. When we were running it, I don't think I ever saw the number get above 32,000. I don't remember what it was. This gave some explanation of it, and it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. The largest int the computer holds. Yeah, right. I never saw it up in the two billions. So I don't think that that's correct. Maybe we could do a, a search on the Microsoft version of it. I'm going to highlight that. Hit F1. Returns a pseudo random number. Returns a pseudo random number. Between 0 to rand max 32767. Okay. You don't have to memorize that. Just know that it's going to return a number between 0 and about 32,000. That seems like a real limit to me. I've seen random number generators you can you know use up to the millions or the billions or whatever. So to generate a random number between two and three two seven six seven. I think that was that. Yeah. Okay. Hope it kind of makes sense why we're using modulus. Like if you want a random number between 1 and 10, you're going to modulus by 10 and add 1 because modulus 10 is just taking the last digit of it, right? 89 modulus 10 is 9. 72 modulus 10 is 2. 3 modulus 10 is 3, right? So it wipes out the rest of it. It just preserves the last number. Now modulus 6 or 20 or whatever is going to work differently, but it, it does the same thing, right? It reduces the range of it. And then you add 1 to bump it up so that instead of being 0 to 19, it's 1 to 20. Anybody have syntax errors now? Random numbers are fun for testing things. You're going to test random input. Or you're going to play a game, but you want the motions of the... Uh, of the things on the screen to start off at random positions on the screen or something like that so the game's not the same every time. Or you're writing a Monopoly game, right? You don't want it to, you know, generate the same die rolls every time. Or Yahtzee or, you know, pick a random number between 1 and 100. There's all sorts of purposes for random number generators. If you're going to test an array sort algorithm, you might want to fill your array with random values. Hand tracing a program. This is more like fundamentals of programming. Hand tracing a program act as if you are the computer executing a program. Step through and execute each statement one by one. Well, we can do that. We're going to write a little program down here. I'm not actually putting in the source code. Okay, so int x. CIN error error x. I'm not writing a whole program, right? int y, cin error error y, int z, z equals x times y. But I'm going to change this up a little bit. While, I mean, not that we've used while loops, but you've heard of while loops before. While x is less than 10, parentheses, z equals x times y, C out Z, or maybe even just leave that off. And then X plus plus to add 1 to X. And then we're going to C out Z, and that's our program. That's what our program's going to do. Okay, well, what's it going to do? Tell you what, I'm going to delete this line, and I'm just going to set X equal to 1. Okay, let's test it. But we're not going to type it in and run it. We're going to do a thought experiment and figure out. So I need some way of recording the value of these variables. And I'm going to use a spreadsheet. All right, 
So in my spreadsheet, I need a column for X. A column for Y and a column for Z. So we're going to start off. First line of code. X equals 1. Okay, we put a 1 there. Next line of code. Y. Well, we've defined it, but we don't have anything in it. And then CIN error error Y. Let's say the user types in a 7. So y is equal to 7, but x remained unchanged, so I'm not going to write a new value there. Next line, z, we create a z variable. While x is less than 10, is x less than 10? It sure is, it's a 1. I'm going to lower this because I don't want to repeat that many times. I'm going to change that to a 4. Okay, so is x less than 4? It sure is. So we go down to this one, z is equal to x times y. Well, what is x? I put that in a Z column? No, no, no. This is confusing me. Let me center this stuff because I'm getting confused. It did not center. Derp. All right, thanks. Okay. All righty then. So, if z is equal to 1 times 7, 1 times 7 is 7. The other variables did not change. Next line of code, add 1 to x. All right, we can do that. It was 1. It changes to 2. Loop back up. Is x still less than 4? It sure is, because it's equal to 2. All righty. So, z is equal to x times y. Well, now it's 2 times 7, so z is equal to 14. Add 1 to x, x was 2, becomes 3. Is 3 less than 4? Sure is. So go to the next line, z is equal to x times y, 3 times 7 is 21. Add 1 to x, x is now 4. Go back up here, is 4 less than 4? Honestly, 4 is not less than 4. It's equal to 4, so that's false. So it falls through and it prints out 21. That would be the output. Print out 21. Now, we hand traced it. If we type this code in and ran it like that, we should get the same answer. How often did I do that in real life? Eh, I didn't do that. Pretty much. Why? Because you can make the debugger do that. You can set your Visual Studio into debugger mode, and you can step through it line by line and watch those variables change. But I know that this is a discipline that uh, sometimes you may need to use at some point in your life, so you have now seen it. And if you took fundamentals, you've, you saw it in that class as well. So that's called hand tracing. You pretend you are the computer. Set up a spreadsheet with your variables, step through it line by line, updating the variables. A case study. Well, I think this would be a good case study to take a break. Let's come back at 8.35. So a case study. General crates build custom designed wooden crates. You've been asked to write a program that calculates volume, cost, customer price, and the profit. And oh boy, we got a lot of variables here. Cost per cubic foot. It's a named constant. It's a double. It's initialized with a value 0 0.23. That's the cost of building a crate per cubic foot. And then the charge per cubic foot. A named constant declared as a double and initialized with a value 0 0.5. Represents the amount charged for a crate per cubic foot. And then length and width and height. And then volume, which we will calculate, and then cost, and then the charge, and then the profit. All right, how do we calculate all that? We need some rules for calculating the volume. Well, that'll be easy. It's length times width times height. The cost, which is going to be something like cost per cubic foot times the volume. And then the charge, which is going to be the charge per cubic foot. 
And then are we going to subtract the 2 to get the profit? Let's find out. Ask the user to enter the dimensions of the crate. Calculate the crate's volume, the cost of building it, the customer's charge, and the profit made. Display the steps. Now, I still don't have a good clue as to how to do the profit, so let's keep going. Maybe they give us some examples. I'm already tired of this example. Yeah, we know. All right. I want to see the actual answer just because I want to know if the profit is equal to the cost minus the charge. Here we go. It's the charge minus the cost. Okay. So, we may as well write this. Let's remind ourselves of the variable names that they wanted. Cost per cubic foot and charge per cubic foot. Cost per cubic foot is 0.23. Charge per cubic foot is 0 0.5. Now why don't we stick that up at the top of main now? Crate cost program. We need some variables to hold all this stuff. So cost double space cost per cost underscore per underscore cubic underscore foot equals 0 0.23 just according to what they said. The next one's going to be charge per cubic foot. Cost space double space charge underscore per underscore cubic underscore foot equals 0 0.5 semicolon. Now we need a variable for the length and the width and the height. And we need a variable to hold the customer cost, the charge, and the profit. Sounds like six variables. Double space length comma width comma height. L comma W comma H would probably have been enough. I always misspell height and make it I before E. I don't know whoever invented the term I before E, but it seems like the vast majority of words actually do not have I before E. All right, and then the double cost, comma, charge, comma, profit, semicolon. That ought to be enough to do the problem. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to ask for the length and the width and the height. And then from that, we're going to calculate the charge and the cost of the profit. And I guess we'll display all that information at the end. Now, why are we using doubles for this? Well, because the cost per cubic foot winds up being a fractional value because they're multiplying it times 0 0.23. And if everything was an int, it'd be bad news. We'll try to multiply by 0 0.23. Might round down to zero and then all of our costs and everything are zero, anyways. It would not be goodness. So let's ask for the length and the width and the height. So see how error, error, quote crates are us backslash in, end quote, semicolon. See how error, error, quote, what is the length? of the crate question mark space space greater than and then we're going to do cin error error length of course and we'll also do the same thing for width and height so i might just do some copying and pasting cin error error great cin greater than greater than length semicolon now i have those two statements and width and height ought to look the same, so I'm just going to copy those two statements and paste it twice. Right-click copy. Right-click paste. Right-click paste and then make some judicious edits. Change that one to width and width. And this one to height and height.
Now we're going to be able to ca calculate the cost and the charge and the profit. But first we need the volume, and I forgot to create a variable for volume. I could go back up and edit it, add that onto my declarations up at the top, right? Or I could create it right here on the spot. There's no law saying you have to create your variables up at the top of the code. But I'm going to. I'm going to modify this line that says double cost charge profit to say double space volume comma cost charge profit. So I just changed this line. Added a new variable there. All right, let's calculate it. Volume equals length times width times height, semicolon. Cost equals volume times capital CH charge per cube weight. Cost per cubic foot up. Capital C O S T. C O S T underscore per underscore cubic underscore foot. Semicolon. Charge equals volume asterisk C H A R G E underscore per underscore cubic underscore foot. Semicolon. And then the profit is the charge minus the cost of materials. So profit equal wait profit equals charge minus cost minus cost. Now let's print some information. Like the customer wants a three by four by five crate, something like that. That ought to be our first print statement. See out. Arrow, arrow, quote, the customer wants a, end quote, arrow, arrow, length, semicolon. This could all be on one line. I'm just doing it on multiple lines. See out, arrow, arrow, quote, space, by, space, end quote, arrow, arrow, width. arrow, arrow, quote, space, by, space, end quote, arrow, arrow, height, semicolon, and then C out, arrow, arrow, quote, space, crate, period, backslash end, end quote. This is called echoing your input. Why do you echo the input? So that the customer can look at it and make sure they entered the data correctly. Just like when you click, you know, purchase order or purchase your item on Amazon, you can always review the stuff that you're ordering before you click the buy button. And then after you click the buy button, you can, you know, scroll up and down and make sure that what you ordered is what you meant to order. So you can quickly run to cancel it. All right, so we told them what the customer wants. So let's calculate the charge for the cost, which one do we want to print first? Sorry, C O U T area error error blah, blah, blah. C O U T C O U T less than less than quote charge to customer space end quote or maybe a colon in there. Maybe even a nice dollar sign. End quote space less than less than charge less than less than in deal. Now we need to do the same thing for the cost and the profit. 
C O U T error error quote cost to build or cost of materials cost to build colon space dollar sign end quote error error cost error error EMDL bless you now this is a point where we should not have skipped the stuff about formatting output. Why do I say that? Because it'd be nice to show it in dollars and cents and force it to be, you know, exactly two decimal long each time. And we didn't, so we're not going to make that little nicety at this point. C out error error quote profit e profit can I spell right? Profit colon space dollar sign, end quote, less than, less than, profit, less than, less than, ENDL. I'm sure there's a round function. We could round everything, you know, to the nearest whole dollar, and then it wouldn't print decimal points, but meh, we'll live with it. I wonder if that's going to work. There's then going to be all this other stuff being printed out, so I'm just going to print out some ENDLs to separate this stuff from the what's coming up. So C out less than less than ENDL less than less than ENDL, right? Just to visually separate it. I could stick a pause there too. Wouldn't work for the Mac users, but you know the PC users could do a system parentheses quote pause. The Mac users could use you know ch dot get in order to get a pause. We probably ought to start doing it that way. It's more cross-platform. Alright, what's the length of the crate? 90 by 2 by 4. It's going to cost them $360 to build a 90-foot crate. The cost to build is 165 and so our profit is 194 It looks like it's working. Now, it'd be more awesome if we entered a for loop, I mean a while loop, and we asked them, you know, for another crate and another crate and another crate, and then only when they quit the program would we display, you know, the total profit or whatever. And that's quite enough, I think, for now. So scrolling up the top of this little program was right here, underneath main. all the way down to the length and the width and the height. Then, after that, calculate the volume, the cost and the charge, and the profit. And then our print statements. What if we hated doing system pause? What if we wanted to do something that was cross-platform? I'm going to delete the system pause, and I'm going to do it the right way, which is we're going to need a temporary variable just to hold the enter key. So C -A -A -C -H -A -R, temp, semicolon, C out error error quote press enter space greater than end quote semicolon and in cin dot get parentheses temp we ought to do that rather than doing system pause because system pause is not cross platform it's windows specific let's make sure it works what's the length of the crate five by five by five and again it zipped right past it that's annoying we'd have to put a cin dot ignore in front of it that's why we just use pause, right? CIN dot ignore nine 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 comma single quote backslash n end quote or end apostrophe semicolon. All right, now it's going to work, and I kind of regret not just having used system pause. I may just use system pause in class. You might copy and paste that. Maybe we ought to put it in, in the boilerplate. And then we could just copy and paste it whenever we want. I might do that. I don't know. I'm going to leave that alone. 
All right, what's the length? Six, five, four, press enter. All right, see that's a cross-platform way of doing it. It's good for the Mac and the Linux users. Sorry, I paused. I'm trying to think something. And I have a steadily increasing migraine that's causing lights to flash in my eyes, which is interrupt that trying to think of something. What am I trying to think of? You don't know. All right, I'm going to have to cheat. No momento. Let's state our problem as though it were homework. It's going to be a multi-line comment, so I did slash star, and I'm going to do some star slashes. I mean, star slash at the end. So, task. Ask the user for their age and a difficulty level. Calculate their target heart rate. They're doing some cardio. Difficulty level should be between 0.5 and 0.8. We will tell them that. Point 0.8 is kind of excessive. You really shouldn't go 0.8 of your max heart rate, but it's all right. And the equation, the formula, is target heart rate, I'm just going to call it target, equals difficulty, asterisk, parentheses, 220 minus age, in parentheses. So that's our task. And then we should display the results, right? Display the results. Use make every variable a double. Now you know what would be awesome is if we ask them instead of a, for a 0.5 to 0.8 we said things like you know easy, moderate, or difficult and then we converted that to the number but we're not going to make it that, that sophisticated. So we need some variables. Name a couple of variables, maybe three. Well they're kind of blatant right there because my cursor's on it. One could be called age, one could be called difficulty, and one could be called, I don't know, target. If we want to be really specific, we could make it target underscore heart underscore rate or something to that effect, but I think target's enough. We need to ask them that. We need to tell them that the difficulty should between, be between 0.5 and 0.8. Then we're going to calculate the target heart rate using that formula, and we're going to display the results. So after the multi-line comment, all right, so double space age, comma, difficulty, comma, target. If we were awesome, we would have declared these on different lines so that we could add comments. So I'm going to redo it, double age, semicolon. Double difficulty semicolon and double target semicolon. Now I'm going to add some commons. Age in years. Difficulty between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. And lastly, target heart rate in beats per minute.
Now, do you have to line up your comments like that? Nah, you're just trying to make it readable, but you don't. There's no law that says your comments have to be lined up like that. Alrighty, we have to ask them for the age. Let's tell them what we're doing. See out less than less than quote. Let's calculate your target cardio heart rate. Exclamation point backslash in. I think I'll take the space out of heart rate just so that I can put a semicolon there and have it all on the screen. You don't need to do that. You can do what you want. So C out less than less than what is your age in years question mark space space greater than end quote semicolon C I N greater than greater than H C out error error quote select a difficulty level period between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 period backslash in end quote semicolon CIN arrow arrow excuse me CIN greater than greater than difficulty semicolon now we need to calculate if anybody was typing along what was our formula target equals somebody remind me of the formula because it's not on my screen anymore yeah, target equals difficulty, asterisk, parentheses, 220 minus age, in parentheses, semicolon. Now let's tell them what we did. C out, less than, less than, quote, calculating, or, we have calculated your target period backslash in end quote semicolon. See out arrow arrow less than less than quote target rate equals space end quote less than less than target less than less than quote, space beats per minute, period, end quote, back, whoopsie, whoopsie, period, backslash in, end quote, semicolon. Now that didn't all fit on the screen. Bummer that. I think I'll change this a little bit. We have calculated your target space heart rate. Is there a space and heart rate? Probably. And then the target space equals there. Now I can space it out correctly. Get it all to fit on the screen at the same time. And we need another system pause or another series of that um, lines like we did up here. I'm just going to copy and paste this stuff. But if you want to put system pause instead, we've already got a variable called temp, so I don't need to repeat that. I'm going to copy those four lines of code, scroll down here, paste it down here, but comment out the declaration of that variable. Now it'll press enter. Doing it in the cross-platform way. I don't care if you use system pause. I don't care if you don't pause at all. Looks like I have an error. Build failed. wonder what I did wrong. Conversion from time t to int. Okay, that's a warning. Age. Redefinition. All right, so somewhere I declared a variable called age, and then I declared it again. Bummer. Let's just comment it out. 
If you get that error, find where it says int space age and comment it out. We've already got it declared. All right, what's the length of the crate? Five by five by five. Press enter. What's your age? Well, I'm pretty old, I'm 70. Difficulty, but I'm pretty tough cardio, so 0 0.8. Your target is 120 beats per minute. Now I'm gonna run it again. Length of the crate, two by two by two. What's your age in years? I'm 50. I want to do a difficulty of 7.75, 127.5 beats per minute. Sounds good to me. That's what my treadmill usually shows me. All righty, there we go. So, anybody getting any syntax errors or need me to scroll up and down? So, reviewing, here's our declarations. We ask for the age and the difficulty level. Pause if you need to. Calculate our target. Display some information. And then use system pause or our newfangled way of doing it. All right, so let's go ahead and, I don't know, maybe have a pair of assignments based on the concepts we've already done here. I'm going to just scroll down because it's easier to find the homework if it's at the bottom of the document. So homework. Two tasks. One. We're going to do a BMI calculator, which stands for Body Mass Index. Seems like we did this one as an example. Rewrite it if we did. Don't just copy and paste what we did last time. Ask the user for their weight in pounds and height in inches and calculate their BMI for the C's body mass index in parentheses. The formula is BMI equals 703 times the weight divided by POW parentheses height comma two in parentheses. or just height times height, but you better divide. Go with that, right? Height squared. Display the results, make every variable a double. Per gallon calculator. And this is an easy calculation, right? Miles per gallon, you're going to divide the miles by the gallons and you're going to get your answer. Not a complex calculation. Ask the user for how many gallons the trip took and how many miles it was. Calculate the MPG, parentheses, miles per gallon, as miles divided by gallons. Display the results, make every variable a double. Now, it could be that this is going to be an extremely simple assignment for you, and you'll get it done in a few minutes. That's okay. Put both tasks in the same file. Upload the file in the screenshot. 
All right, that's going to be our homework assignment. You probably already know how to do all this, I would expect. I don't see anything new in here, but I don't mind having y'all repeat the process of asking for the input and getting the output. The only thing that would have made it more interesting is if we had used a while loop so that we could repeat these tasks until the user was tired of calculating trips, right, or BMIs, or whatever. And maybe next time. What would also be cool is if we were made it so that they got to choose which we wanted to do, right? Press one for miles per gallon, two for BMI. They pick one or the other, and then it does that task. If you know how to do it, that'd be pretty neat, right? So bonus credit. Have the program ask one for BMI, two for MPG. Let the user enter the choice, and then do, and then perform. either one or two based on their selection. So you can have an extra CIN statement and you're gonna have a big if statement, right? If else. Have we talked about if else? No, but you've had other programming classes and if not, you can open up your textbook, go to the index and find if statements and else statements. If you know what a switch statement is, you can get wild and crazy and use a switch statement instead, but Python didn't have one, so a lot of you don't. The Java folks do. All right. We will go back to formatted output on Wednesday. Can't skip it completely. Formatted output is really useful with loops. We haven't talked about loops yet. When it's formatted output, it's specifying the width and the precision of each piece of data you print. Right? Because if you're trying to line your stuff up, and it looks like this, and then the next time you print it, it says 2.417, and this one, uh, you know, 1.2, you know, the spaces are going to be all Wobbly. Now, sure, you could use a tab instead and hope that works. That might not be how you want to position it. What's another thing you can do? You can specify the width of each piece of data. I want you to occupy five characters on the screen, and I want you to occupy five characters on the screen. That might do it. Not a bad way. Or you could specify, I want three decimals for every piece of output, right? Then it might line up all, you know, nicely in columns as well. So you have several different tactics for formatting your output. Another reason we might want to do this is for dollar signs, right? Dollar sign 1.23. We only want to display two cents, right? Not two cents. Two decimal places after the dollar. That's our standard. You probably have to calculate it that way rather than, you know, round it off just during the display or whatever. You know, would have been nice if our create program had formatted it correctly. If we look at the case study, we'll probably see how they did it. That will be a sneak preview for what we see on Monday, so on Wednesday. I wonder if the microphone picks me up when I'm over there. Nope. They did not format the output. They did just what we did. So if it says, you know, $3.2, that's what we got. All right, we are at the end of the chapter, except for the formatted output. Which, as I said, I want to wait. I'm not sure what to talk about for the next 20 minutes. I'm not sure whether to let us leave. I'm leaning towards that. Will anybody feel cheated and get out a little bit early? It's okay to say yeah. Or if you have questions over homework. Some folks don't have everything graded yet. My fault. I will get them all graded by Wednesday. All right. So why don't we stop here? The homework assignment made sense? Okay.